Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Ensemble Network webcast. Thank you to all our listeners who are tuned in today. My name is Lindsay Kajura, Manager of Diversity Initiatives for the Mining Industry Human Resource Council, and joining me today is a special guest speaker, Weil. As many of you know, MIR established its mandate to identify opportunity and ultimately address the HR and labor market challenges in the Canadian minerals and metals sector. The Canadian mining industry faces a significant challenge in establishing a sustainable supply of labor that is able to withstand mining's economic volatility. MIR, through its labor market intelligence, has identified a number of factors exacerbating this challenge. Canada's aging population continues to have a significant impact, and diverse groups such as women and newcomers to Canada are underrepresented in the mining labor force. Our research indicates that women comprise half of Canada's population and about 48% of its labor force, yet in the mining labor force, women only represent 17%. Improving this statistic involves a combination of collaborative solutions, from encouraging young girls to pursue, pursue math and science studies, to building a gender inclusive awareness of the industry, to appointing more women to senior leadership and board positions. Many organizations have realized the need to fundamentally think differently about the diversity of talent and ways of inspiring inclusion as a means of preparing the workforce for the future. Increasingly, organizations are looking at how data can be used to advance diversity and inclusion in their workplace. In this presentation, Weil will share practical experiences from the resource sector and highlight how analytics can be used to audit and measure progress for diversity and inclusion. So with that said, I will pass along to you, Weil. Um, well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> if you are uh, around me here in Vancouver and uh, good afternoon to all of you who are uh, with Eastern Canada. Uh, thank you so much, Lindsay, and thank you MIHR for having me. I'm going to share my presentation. Can you see it, Lindsay? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, so my name is Wael Bawin. I am the CEO of HRX. It's a consulting firm um, that I will talk about some of the work we do. Me, myself, I, um, I speak and work in um, the area of our organizations, workplaces, people. I speak a lot about technology and data and how that will impact future trends related to our people. Um, if you uh, would like to follow some of the work I did, uh, some of my uh, articles and publications were shared on Forbes, uh, CBC, uh, Vancouver Sun. We worked with some big uh, organizations here in Canada, Best Buy, Canfor, Ledcor, and Architerix, and we have a few research projects uh, with the University of Toronto and University of Victoria. Uh, so that's me. And about the Charix, uh, our focus at the Charix is to develop solutions for inclusive people practices. So people practices, that's, that's HR. Um, we would like to make um, the recruitment process, the promotion process, the, any process that relate to our people uh, more inclusive. Um, the service that we uh, offer are under three pillars, we call them, or three types of services. The first one is auditing, um, strategy and consulting around people practices. The other one is training and leadership development. So uh, how to uh, prepare and support our leaders and employees to, to create an inclusive workplace. And then the last one, which I will refer to a lot today is people data and analytics. So how can we use numbers and evidence in guiding our effort to make our workplace more inclusive? Um, so that's HRX and that's me. Um, the discussion today, I thought I'll structure it around the three questions of what, why, and how. Um, I'll spend 30 to 45 minutes. I will aim for that. Sometimes I spend <laughs> way more time, uh, but uh, hopefully we we'll get onto that target. And then after that, we'll open it for questions. Is that okay, Lindsay? Yes, that's perfect. Great. I'll have Lindsay here around me to, to support me. I have uh, a few exercises and, and questions. Um, so, so Lindsay will be around. Um, and yes, this is a, a casual conversation. I'll share some interesting things that uh, I heard of and, and uh, we saw in research. I'll, I'll share some of our experience working with organizations. And the goal is to give you um, one or two or three 
thoughts that will make you think, huh, this is interesting. I, uh, maybe I can, I can do that, or maybe I can build on that. Um, and, and it's a conversation that's continuing, and uh, I don't think it will end uh, anytime soon. So, so let's start. The first question I will, I will talk about is, what's the current state of diversity and inclusion in the workplace? Um, and then the second one, I'll talk about, okay, if that's the current state, why does inequality persist? And then how do we address it in our organization? A few solutions, a few, a few ideas uh, in how to use a systemic approach and data-driven approach to address uh, these issues. Um, so where we were some time ago, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Elizabeth Stewart, she shared this with us some time ago and we were all shocked. So she found this um, 1943 guide to hiring women. I know that MIHR, a, a big component of the work they do is around gender. So I thought this might be interested, interesting for you all. Um, a 1943 guide. So this is 70 years ago. Yeah, 70, 70 years ago, a little bit more. Uh, and it's, it lists steps of how to hire women. Um, like, uh, I think it's 11 points. And here are two examples, uh, point number eight and point number nine. So um, give every girl an adequate number of rest periods during the day. You have to make some allowances for feminine psychology. Uh, and then number nine, be tactful when issuing instructions or in making criticism women are often sensitive so this is uh i don't know it was very interesting for me seeing this and i'm like oh um and this is how to hire women i'm sure there were also articles about how to hire black people and how to hire uh people of color and how to hire uh asian people and and stuff like that so just to give you an idea of where we came you know and uh and how things were in the past. So good progress. Um, we have a gender gap in education now. I don't know if, if, if you know, but women are surpassing men and getting a university degree. There is a gap that's favoring women, uh, which is interesting news, right? However, when we look at business, so this is an article for the New York Times, some research around uh, the CEOs of S&P 1500 companies by name. They found that uh, the CEOs that call John are 5.3% of the 1500 CEOs. David is second, and then all women combined are 4%. So talk about uh, inequality. Um, these are the numbers. Joan and David are around 10% together, and all women are 4.1. Um, just fun fact, there are around um, 70 million, I think, 70 million women in the States uh, in the workplace, and there are only 2 million Johns. And the probability of having a John as a CEO is much, much, much higher than all women. Uh, the World Economic Forum issued a research that showed that at the current rate of progress, it may take another 200, more than 200 years to close the economic gender gap. So inequality is there, still there, after all this um, effort and work and talking about it. Uh, in terms of racial inequality, this is a research by Ryerson uh, University. They, they, they looked at visible minorities in Toronto uh, in the business uh, leadership and the corporate boards, they found that visible minorities make up uh, more than half of Toronto's population, but only 3.3% of corporate boards and 9% of the private sector. This is in 2017. Um, this is massive, massive gap, massive gap. Um, and that's talking about visible minorities. LGBT experience research was done by Glassdoor. This was published uh, three, four months ago in 2019. Half of LGBTQ employees say they have experienced verbal discrimination at work. So the number shows that there is still very long way for us 
uh, to achieve um, quality and, and equity in the workplace. Um, I looked at some data from the MIHR around the mining sector. Um, here are the different underrepresented groups the MIHR look at. Um, and you can see the gap between the mining sector and uh, other Canadian sectors um, in terms of women, uh, immigrants, visible minorities. The mining sector is doing better than other Canadian sectors in terms of uh, hiring indigenous people. Uh, but you can see uh, some of the gaps. And, uh, and this is very consistent with um, male dominated industries such as forestry um, and other industries where um, the, the, issue, the discussion around gender and um, hiring new Canadians and visible minorities and indigenous people is, is still um, not really making that much progress. Um, all of that, despite many CEOs and leaders now, they list diversity and inclusion as a priority. This is research by PwC in 2017, a survey they did. Uh, global leaders, big organizations, 87% of them said it's a priority. But the progress is slow. And if we look and evaluate a lot of these DNI and uh, interventions and initiatives, we find them that despite the best of intentions, they are ineffective or backfire. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the why. Why do we have these issues? Not every reason, but I will I will touch on on one of them, which is the way we think, just like how our brains think, and how do we make decisions, and is that related to this uh, diversity and inclusion uh, gap that we see. So, so let's, uh, let's talk about how we think. Uh, there's a phenomenon called autopilot. Uh, it's being consumed by our own thoughts and not focused on the outside world or the task at hand. So, Lindsay, I'm sure uh, you were parking. I, I had that many times. Uh, I parked my car in a parking lot uh, I go shopping or like get the grocery or whatever, I come back and I forgot where I parked my car. Now, I was totally conscious. I was a, like aware. I parked the car I was driving. I wasn't asleep, right? But still, I park the car, I go and come back and I'm like, where did I park the car? And I have no idea where I, where, where I parked the car. Uh, the other one is driving to work. After, uh, after a while, it becomes just an autopilot uh task you drive you come back and people say hey did you see this new coffee shop or this new hospital or this new building and you're like no i drive on that road every day twice and i haven't noticed that so um, so that's autopilot and the reason behind that is that we have very limited attention uh, they say that we uh, and and each specific point of time there are 11 million pieces of information. So think about now, when you are looking at this webinar, think about things around you. There is uh, your laptop or computer you're looking at. There is the room you're in. There is the clothes you're wearing, the clothes if there are people around you, um, their uh, hairstyle, uh, the temperature, the, uh, the sounds around you, and all of that. That's a lot of information. That's a lot of information you can process only 40 of them maximum at a time so 99.99999 now wherever uh, of the things around us we don't really pay attention to and that's because of the limited attention uh, of our our brains there's a, a fascinating book called thinking fast and slow i'm sure many of you uh, read it or heard about it by diane Kahneman, and he uh, he looks at this phenomena and uh, the whole idea uh, of the book is that we have two systems in our brains. System one, which is fast, intuitive, and emotional. It operates automatically and quickly with very little uh, control. We can't control system one. It just operates by itself, uh, and it's so quick, so fast, and so uh, intuitive. Uh, and then we have system two, which is slower, more deliberative, more logical, it requires attention, so it requires some energy 
Uh, and that's the part we use when we do complex uh, thinking. So um, I'll give you an example about these two systems, just, to, just for you to, to grasp the idea of system one and system two. So all of you now listening to me, uh, Lindsay, you're included. I want you to keep your eyes open. Don't close your eyes, keep your eyes open. And I don't want you to read the following words. Good, are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> okay, so. Lindsay, did you manage not to read the text? I failed, I read the text. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do it again. I want you to keep your eyes open and I don't want you to solve the following equation. One, two, three. Did you manage not to solve the equation? Correct, I did, I did not manage to solve the equation. <laughs> <laughs> was, it, was it easy to just um block our brain from solving the equation compared to reading the text yes yes yeah definitely because the text is just it's so much easier to read the text as a, in comparison to the equation that takes more time absolutely so most people can't stop themselves from reading the text it's just automatic something that operates in our brain without any control uh it's under system one right but they can easily ignore the equation and that's the difference between system one and system two to read english you need system one to solve math equation, you need system two. So system one has like no, con like you can't control it. Anytime you see English text, you will read it without, uh, even if you don't want to do that. Well, uh, solving math equation, any complex, uh, complex uh, computation requires system two. It's easy for you to switch that off. Now, quickly judging people is in system one. So think about it. You're standing in the line in the grocery store someone does something weird you automatically will look at the clothes they wear the the way they they made their hair do they have children or not their age their skin color their clothes and you will make a judgment automatically that's just exactly the way you read english uh, and then maybe you will push yourself uh to say oh no 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 this is this is uh like is judgment uh no no i should be objective why did i judge that person based on their age or based on the clothes they wear and that requires a little bit of effort from you that requires conscious effort to operate system two uh, and our unconscious biases are in system one the way we judge racial uh gender um uh, sexual orientation uh the way uh people uh, like uh economic background um, we judge them uh, automatically in system one. That's our unconscious bias. Where our conscious thinking is in system two. We need to have a little bit of effort, uh, use a little bit of energy to trigger that. So that's the difference between system one and system two. So unconscious bias, the definition of unconscious bias is, one of the definitions of unconscious bias, I should say, it's the negative stereotypes we hold outside of our conscious awareness against certain social groups, women, LGBTQ, Asian Canadians, Muslims, engineers, accountants, uh, zookeepers, I don't know. Any of these groups based on what you saw in videos and movies and media, uh, what people told you, uh, you start generating stereotypes in your brain and these are all in your system one um, outside of your conscious thinking these unconscious biases are shaped by our experience and environment and can influence our perceptions attitudes behaviors without conscious intention so this is the interesting thing you are walking the street someone um, from a specific social group i don't know um and your attitude toward them will be different based on your unconscious bias so you might uh, walk normally or you might avoid them or you might uh, not look in the eye uh, and that's totally unconscious um so it doesn't only uh, impact our perception but also our attitude and behavior we can treat people differently just based on our unconscious biases which is fascinating and that's what the science and the research uh, is exploring now um all that impact uh, before i move from from this system one system two i would like to play another game um i played it yesterday with Lindsay, and i will tell you what the results uh later 
but I will, I will try to prime your system one. So let's play this game together. So Lindsay and I, we will repeat the word white 10 times loud. Uh, and I want you all to repeat it with me. Okay, please be loud. I want you to be loud and uh, we'll do it 10 times. Are you ready, Lindsay? I'm ready. Okay, so let's start. White. 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 If you said milk, like Lindsay yesterday, <laughs> you, you, fall, uh, you, you fell in the trap of system one. Cows don't drink milk. Um, so that's, that's the first one. Uh, let me explain what happened now, but uh, let's do it an, uh, again. Let's do it with top. This one, Lindsay didn't do. So let's, let's, uh, let's see. Lindsay, let's do it. T 10 okay. times top, okay? One, okay. two, three. Top, top. top. Top, 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 top. What do you do when you see a green light? Go. Good job. If you are one of the people who said stop, then you also get tricked by system one. The reason here is white and cow and milk are linked to each other in our system one. And when I say white, 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 and, and I say, I mentioned cow, you automatically think of milk. Um, and that shows you the power of system one. System one totally can control our thinking uh, with, uh, without our permission. This is exactly what they do when you watch a movie or a TV show and um, you are you are there. You are sitting. You are totally prepared. Um, uh, you are really focused on the show, and then the music gets a little bit slower, and then the lighting gets a little bit darker, and then something happens, and you jump off your seat, or some like your favorite character dies or whatever, and then we start like getting emotional or crying. Now our system too knows that nothing really happened. It's all acting. <laughs> <laughs> but system one still tricks us and um, and we totally fall under the control of system one. Um, now system one and that influence of priming is all around us. Uh, all this media, all this uh, uh, like articles and, and movies and, and TV shows and images that we see, they all prime us, they all prime system one. Um, if you, if I say software engineer or CEO or a nurse or police chief, actually I, I googled these um, and I found the first photo that appeared to me, or like most of the photos that appeared to me, they look exactly like what you see on the screen. And Google search does a really good job in imitating our thinking uh, because these are the photos that we click when we want to make a presentation about a nurse or a software engineer or something. Uh, or we read an article. This is the, these are the photos that are used. Um, and it's totally based on our culture and our environment. Uh, a nurse, this is what we would expect. Look at her gender, look at the skin color, look at her age, uh, look at the CEO, look at the software engineer, look at the police chief. These are uh, the images that we store in our system one. And this is because of priming. Uh, so that's, that's unconscious bias. Um, it just makes us think every time we want to hire someone as a software engineer, a person who looked exactly like the photo I just showed you will have an advantage because that, their photo is stored in system one. If we want to hire someone who's different, we have to push system two and make an effort. Uh, exactly when Lindsay stopped and thought and said, no, it's not, uh, it's what, what you do when you see a green light, you go. It requires an effort. So the impact of unconscious bias uh, is like a lot of um, case studies that I'm sure many of you have read. Uh, this one from Stanford around hiring um, uh, a lab manager, a science lab manager, and uh, two exact resumes, same qualifications, same experience, were sent to two groups. Uh, one of the resumes, uh, the name on it was John, 
and the other one, the name on it was Jennifer. They just switch the, they just made different names for the resumes, same resumes. Um, and the feedback and the evaluation of the two resumes was totally different based on the on the name. Same qualifications, same experience. Uh, Jennifer was judged as less qualified and um, and even she was uh, offered less salary, around 13% less salary than John. Uh, so that's our bias uh, for the STEM, STEM positions, science uh, and the engineering sector. We, we think men, uh, our unconscious biases think that men have an advantage, right? And, we, and it impacts our behavior and thinking and perception and attitude, as I said earlier. Uh, the other one is this uh, study by University of Toronto around um, hiring. So they sent uh, hundreds of resumes, uh, similar resumes, same resumes, same experience. And they called some of them, they gave them Western names like John and, and Catherine. And the other ones, they gave them Asian names, um, Indian names and Chinese names. And the response was different. Agent names received 30%, 20 to 40% less respo uh, response, uh, less uh, callbacks for interviews. Um, and it's just because of the uh, of the name, only the name. The resumes are exactly the same. Uh, and then there's the impact of our affinity bias. Affinity bias is one of the unconscious biases. It's that bias that makes us more friendly and, and prefer people who look and behave and uh, and from our our like uh, personal circles that we are familiar with um, and that impacts some of the industries that we work with uh, that are male dominated industries because um, the industry is dominated by a specific group uh, usually men usually white uh, even age um, is uh, there is not that much diversity in age and and these people um, like people who look and behave like them like people who communicate like them like people who make decisions like them like people who think like them uh, and that impacts the chances of people who are from different ethnicity different age group or different gender uh, so that's the impact of unconscious bias, and um, it's I I see it a lot. Uh, I don't know if you all see this. Uh, it's very familiar um, in our organizations and in many industries actually, in law and technology, uh, as I said, in the male-dominated sectors of forestry, mining, and uh, and so on. Okay. So what's the solution? What is the magic pill? This is a funny article. Um, boss wants friendly, relaxed company culture in place by Friday. Is that possible? No, it's not possible. Uh, it's not a problem that you can solve easily, right? Um, and what often happens is this scenario that me and Lindsay will, will demonstrate. Uh, so we'll go sh just through a conversation that uh, it happens a lot actually. So are you ready, Lindsay? Should we start? I'm, I'm ready. Okay, so the phone rings and then I am saying, hi, Lindsay, it's Wild from Corporate Land. Do you have a minute to chat? Wild, great to hear from you. Yes, of course, how can I help? Well, our executives have decided we really need a stronger focus on diversity and inclusion. We have, ha we have had some poor media attention of late. I'm sure you're aware of it. Ah, uh, yes, I've heard. No doubt you've been very busy doing damage control. Yes, indeed. In fact, and then insert 10 minutes of rambling of jargon, acronyms, and names here. So, Lindsay, the long and short of it is we would love it if you could come in and run a couple of lunch and learn sessions to eliminate bias next week. Fabulous. Just so we're on the same page, I want to confirm that you wish to eliminate bias in a couple of one hour lunch and learn sessions in order to address your company wide systemic bias that has recently resulted in legal action and national brand damage. Yes, exactly. That's about the sum of it, Lindsay. Are you able to provide the code? And, and this is like we see this all the time, all the time. 
uh, how do we address uh, uh, these issues of systemic uh, bias and, and uh, the gap uh, between uh, the groups and all of that just uh, offer unconscious bias training. So I have, uh, I have these two uh, examples, fact or fiction. So I want you all to, to look at this statement and tell me what you think. You think it's correct or false. Unconscious bias training is crucial to driving positive behavioral change uh, in the workplace. Is this correct or false? This is false. Uh, actually, a lot of research around the impact of unconscious bias training. So just a, a disclaimer here, we offer unconscious bias training at HRX, yet we always tell our client uh, training alone will not change behavior. Um, you can't expect one or two or half a day or full day training to change people's behavior. Um, it's better if you position your training, conscious bias training, within uh, uh, an initiative, a systemic initiative to change, uh, to improve the culture. You know, so that's unconscious bias training. The next one. It's impossible to shift behavior without first shifting hearts and mind. Do you think this is true or false? I get tricked by this one as well. Um, this is false. This is false. And I was, I was, uh, I, I saw this two years ago in a conference, and I'm like, huh, that's very interesting. Um, it's not uh, essential to shift people's hearts and mind to, ch to shift their behavior. Actually, there is a lot of work now uh, based on a, on a great book called Nudge um, around changing people's behavior without them noticing, without them even buying in. And there is a lot of work in media, in marketing, in, uh, in healthcare, and even like the grocery store you go to. They designed the whole grocery store to make you make decisions that you are not aware of. They want you to buy some products more. They want you to go through some uh, specific path. Uh, and it's very possible to change people's behavior just by the changing the design around them. Uh, for example, I remember there is, a, there is this experiment in a, in a college where in the cafeteria, they made the healthy uh, food uh, on the same level of the eye, and they made the not healthy food uh, lower. So you have to bend down to pick something not healthy. And uh, the students started buying more healthy options uh, just because, because of the change of design of the shelves. Fascinating stuff. So you can um, change the behavior or influence the behavior in your organization, but by just design and systemic changes, which we always, always recommend to address the issue of, of bias uh, and discrimination in the organization. Um, so a few notes here, things to take uh, before I talk about the systemic and data-driven approach. First one is be systematic and stop searching for the magic pill. Nothing will change overnight. Uh, I know systematic is sometimes boring. I, I, we work with organizations, they want to have a big initiative about training and announcing big stuff and all of that. And we say, no, 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 be systematic. You have to start here. And they're like, oh, but like, we really want to make like uh, a lot of effort and, and like announce big stuff. And we're like, no, you don't have to. So sometimes boring is best. We need a systematic approach, diversity and inclusion. Training is great to raise awareness, but it won't fix the problem when it's on. Number two, improve what you already have. You don't have to create different initiatives for diversity and inclusion. If you have a, a promotion process, improve it. If you have a hiring process, improve it. If you have, um, uh, if you don't, just create ones. Just look at what you have and make it more inclusive and fair. Um, that's what we always recommend. And then the, the third one is measure what matters. Get curious about the evidence and use data to drive decision making and behavior. So, what is this systematic approach? I'm gonna just just uh, list it here. I'm not gonna go in details. Some of these slides will be sent to you after the the webinar. Uh, this is a this is a model that we use at the Charix to help our clients. We always tell them start with data, audit the culture, look at the numbers. Um, 
that's the most important step to start. Number two, work with your leadership team and build a strategy and plan. So we have the data now, and then we work with the, with the leadership team to build a strategy and plan and get their buy-in. So if we notice that we have issues with hiring, we will focus on that. If the issue is not hiring, it's retention, we will focus on that. If the issue is promotion, uh, people leave because there is no opportunity to, to get promoted, uh, we will look at that, right? So the data helps you shape the strategy and plan. And then activate people leader. People leader are this middle management level, you know, people who are managing other people. And they are very important in making the change. So focus on these people when you start rolling out the, the plan um, and then implement the change when you have people leader support. Implement the change, try to, try to start, uh, as we said, very systematic, start in a specific location or specific office implement a few changes and see the impact and if things uh, are improving after you measure uh, expand that change so that's a systematic approach as uh, we will send you this and um, as you see here in this approach data is there everywhere the first step here then if you see my my cursor here uh, there's data here the data will be used in, in designing the strategy and plan. The data will be shared with people leaders to, to get their buy-in and, and support. We will show them that we have a gap. Maybe other companies are better than us. Um, we have, uh, this is what uh, people from underrepresented groups said. So we are sharing this data with them. We will use the data to implement the change and guide us through the change. And then we need to collect data to see if that change is effective. Um, so that's the, the data. However, just collecting data and getting the data is very hard. More than 65% of chief diversity officers, this is for S&P 500. These are big, large organizations with a lot of resources. So they say that uh, they say that they don't have the employee demographic data they needed to support their work in advancing diversity and inclusion. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, this data. So people data is evolving. Collecting people data is evolving. And this is a big piece of what we do at the Charlex. Um, if you want to think about the data, uh, of course, Quantitative data is important, so uh, how many jobs were posted, how many jobs were filled, how many days we spent to fill a job, what's the turnover rate, you know, what's the promotion rate and all of that. But qualitative data is also important. So surveys, focus groups, one-on-one um, uh, -on -one interviews, these are important data as well. So when I say data, it's not only the numbers, no. It's also what people say and uh, and their experience and their, their response to questions. I'm going to list here um, some areas of these data that we, we usually collect um, just for you to see an example. So employee, de employee demographics, so gender, if you can collect information about sexual orientation, visible minority status. We usually do these through surveys or through onboarding, you know, when employees, uh, new employees join the company. Sourcing data, so how do you source your hiring? So most of your hiring comes through referrals, co-ops, proactive recruiting sourcing, applications via job boards or career pages, uh, and then the recruitment data. So um, what's the progress of people when they get interviewed? How many of them pass the interview? If you have phone interview versus in-person interview, uh, what's the candidate ratings? What's the success rate? What's the rejection reasons? So this is the recruitment data. Employee experience data. So this is the feedback related to uh, leadership commitment, inclusive workplace, uh, fair opportunity. Uh, so these are uh, questions designed to get what people think about these topics. Do you think our leadership committed to diversity and inclusion? Uh, is the workplace uh, inclusive? Uh, is your manager inclusive? Are your colleagues inclusive? Um, and then do you think you have a fair opportunity to, uh, to advance uh, in this company? Are you treated fairly? Um, the, the next area is development data. So 
uh, promotions, learning opportunities, training, and all of that, retention data, turnover rate, uh, employee representation, and then pay data, so compensation, pay increases uh, over time, and bonuses. So these are some of the areas we collected data, and the whole the whole thing is now being simplified. I know you look at this all areas and you're like, oh, this is so much work. No, it's not. Uh, we have tools now in the market uh, that make it so easy to get access to your HR system and mix it with some uh, surveys and, uh, and uh, qualitative data, and then all of that get analyzed and then you get a, a very nice dashboard with three or four or five KPIs or metrics where you can measure progress and, uh, and, uh, and see um, the, the status of specific things. Um, and as I said, people data is evolving. In the past, this is an example of turnover. A company that operates in Canada and, and all these four provinces this is their their uh, turnover data. So, 17% in British Columbia, 23% in Alberta, Ontario, Quebec. These are the numbers. This is the data they track. However, progressive companies now are adding the element of um, demographics. So they they look at the data, the overall data in British Columbia, which is 17. Also, they see the gap between the turnover of women versus men. So as you see here, the turnover of women is much higher, almost double uh, the rate of men. So we have an issue here in British Columbia, where in Ontario, we don't have an issue. The same turnover rate for all. Um, so that like gets you to focus your effort. And instead of targeting all your offices in the country, which is a lot of effort, you can say, hey, for this year, we will, we will uh, pilot some programs in British Columbia and see if we can bridge the gap between these two and maybe move to Quebec next and then roll out that everywhere else. So people data is becoming more progressive. The same thing here, you can also look at it from an age perspective, from um, uh, any other underrepresented group data that you can collect through entry or through uh, surveys. Uh, another thing we track with some of the companies we work with is employee surveys. So employee surveys are also becoming more progressive. So we are measuring also inclusion and in that. We ask a few questions, we give it uh, some uh, points, and then we measure the response of each group. And then we try to associate and look at each social group together. So we can look at men. We can look at millennials, we can look at visible minorities, we can look at indigenous, we can look at women. We can look at white men versus visible minority men. Uh, we can even link two or three of these um, characteristics together and see where people stand on how they see the company. And this is interesting because I was looking at some of the research by MIHR and um, I saw that the response to how inclusive the workplace is was different between men and women. So um, men thought it's a respectful workplace, it's great, things are, uh, are good, where women, uh, not all of them, but some of them had a different view of how the workplace is. Uh, so it's important to see where, where uh, these are on, on a, like a spectrum or like on a, on, a, on a scale where you can target which group of these first. Um, so a few case studies here. Uh, this is a little bit of details, a lot of text you will see. But these are examples we worked on. And I'm going to talk about three examples. One of them is organizations that are small or they just started the conversation. They come to us and say, hey, we just started. We don't even know what to do. Uh, where should we start? And, uh, and we tell them, OK, this is an opportunity to start from scratch. Uh, which is great, like you have you have done nothing, so now we can start from scratch. And then the other thing is data, uh, we can design a framework for you for, to, for what to, to track and collect, which is great. Um, so we can say, focus on these, this is what you do, track this uh, type of data. Uh, and here's an example of a case study we worked with with a technology company and how we helped them going through that process. I'll, I'll share these slides with you.
Number two, companies come to us and say, no, 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 we did some work, we have been doing some work, but unfortunately, not much progress. What should we do? So the opportunity here is to capitalize on leadership commitment. So obviously, someone dedicated some resources, so they have commitment already, right? Which is great, so we can capitalize on that. And then they have some data, which is also good. We can look at the data, we can collect the data and see what, what worked and what not. Um, so that's, that's an example, a case study with an education institution. And then the third one, if large organization have invested in diversity and inclusion for years and they made good progress, now they want to scale the strategy. So um, it's great. There are successes, so now you can embed diversity and inclusion in your core people practices, company-wide. You can just like make it um, core to the practice. So all our promotions will follow this structured process. All our um, learning, mentorship, uh, hiring will follow this structured process. And DNI becomes just part of the work. It's not like a different label, right? Which is great. And the data can guide you to like where to go next. You, you remember my example of let's start with British Columbia and then go to Quebec. If we didn't have the data, we can't make that decision. We will just like go everywhere. Uh, but with data, you can guide your efforts. Uh, and this is a case study with a forestry company that we worked with. Um, so takeaways, we're almost done. Yeah, 946, good. <laughs> takeaways, so take a systematic approach might sound boring but it works direction is so much more important than speed many are going nowhere fast be data driven be intentional with managing your data managing without data is like driving with your eyes closed absolutely true you have no idea where you are going if you don't have data especially in this complex uh, workplaces that we work with now uh, be evidence-based, question assumptions, and get curious about evidence. Uh, question the least, question the assumptions, uh, and, and get the data to make you make these assumptions. So many companies we work with, they always assume recruitment is their problem. And we always question that, say like, based on what? Say, I don't know, we don't have enough women. Okay, did you look at retention? Did you look at the turnover rate? Did you take a look at your promotions? How many women got promoted to a VP role in the last 10 years or director role in the last 10 years? And we find usually none. And, and that's a problem. So always question assumptions and be, be curious about evidence. So questions for you. Did you audit the culture and collect data? Did the data provide insight to your organization? Do you have a clear strategy and plan based on data and systematic approach? Do you have leaders buy-in? And what's working well and what's not working well based on what we discussed today? Uh, and my final word for you is, I really like this quote. The secret of change is to focus all your energy, not on fighting the old. We have these sectors that have been there for hundreds of years and so much to change and fight. That's behind us. Let's just focus on the new. Let's focus on the future. And I look at the future. I look the, uh, at the, the workforce now. I look at uh, people who are committed. And it, it makes me hopeful. It makes me hopeful. I really see uh, change coming. Um, and all of you who joined today are part of it. So thank you very much. Uh, and this is it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Wow, for all of that um, wonderful information on the how to and what to measure. Um, we'll move forward with our question period. So for all of our listeners, you have the ability to type your questions in the chat box on the side of your screen. So you can type those in and we'll read them out and Wow will answer them. So I'll start with the first question. You mentioned that change does not happen overnight. What no. is a realistic time frame for an organization to achieve its diversity and inclusion initiatives? Great question. Um, you'd have told me about this question, Lindsay, to prepare. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good question, and we get asked a lot. Um, so it depends on the size, right, of the organization, and also it depends on the sector. But usually we tell people in 18 months, you should see change. Um, wherever you are implementing that change. There should be some change in 18 months. Um, you design a strategy, you communicate it, you do some training, 
um, and people start uh, really uh, telling you what the issues are and you start noticing what areas you can start with and, uh, and make a few changes and just like the whole culture starts responding slowly but you see some uh, like exciting change uh, which is great so we always recommend 18 months plan uh, for some companies a year was enough 12 months for some companies they needed more than 18 months but in 18 months if nothing happened then uh, a, there is a problem with the strategy or maybe the leadership commitment or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Um, to an additional question is, of course, when it comes to the this change within an organization, there's a lot of people that are involved, a lot of momentum and buy-on that is um, required. How do you respond to those who provide pushback to new initiatives surrounding diversity and inclusion? And so that's that's common, very common. So um will be great to have the resources and the commitment and all of that to push these initiatives but we don't we're always busy our companies have so many other priorities people are busy um, and usually diversity and inclusion is just to the side you know it's an extra work um and there's no strong case, uh, business case for it so we always recommend link it to a very strong business case for the organization one of the great examples we're working with when an organization in the mining um uh in the in the resource industry and the ceo is very concerned about the shortage of um labor that we will face in in less than 10 years we all know that um the workers in these industries are aging and we will have a lot of retirement in the in the next uh, years and there will be a huge shortage so he's very concerned about that and he doesn't want to spend a lot of time trying to find people hire them and and, uh, and all that pressure you know and he is very concerned about or like very motivated to expand the pool of of talent that they are hiring from he wants to explore new canadians he wants to explore uh i don't know people from different age group that they didn't hire from uh gender they, he he really wants to explore that he wants the the company to be ready to welcome all these people and that's a great example then diversity and inclusion is not an initiative just for the sake of it no no it's an initiative to really help the company so anyone who says no we can say hey the whole organization will suffer financially right uh, we need this and that's that's how you get their buy-in awesome well thank you so much for answering those questions and for taking the time to speak with us today and thank you to all of our listeners um, for participating in this webinar and thank you all for sharing your insight and expertise with the network um, if any of our listeners have any further questions or concerns that weren't answered in today's webcast, don't hesitate to start the conversation on Ensemble or contact Mir directly. We encourage you to please stay connected. A recording of today's webinar will be available on the Ensemble site within a few days, and I invite you to review the monthly blog post. This concludes our Ensemble webcast. Enjoy the rest of your day and join us next month on our next webinar. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank, thank you all. Bye. Bye.